At number 10 is Radithor, radioactive water. Yep, you heard that right. Back as recently as the early 20th century, before we knew better when radioactivity was all the rage, pun intended, some folks believed that ingesting radioactive substances could actually improve your health and cure just about anything. From arthritis to acne, heck, even a cure for impotence, cause why the heck not? It's the 1900s and ain't nobody gonna fact check you. It was like the superhero serum of the time. One particularly famous example was the Radithor, a radon infused water tonic that was marketed as a health elixir. People chugged this stuff like it was going out of style, believing it would give them a boost of energy and vitality. But hold your horses, champ, because before you start searching for a bottle of Radithor on eBay, let's talk common sense derived from the benefit of hindsight. While it's true that some forms of radiation can be used for medical purposes today, the kind of radioactivity these historical treatments involved was a whole different story. Adjusting radioactive substances could lead to a host of health issues like tissue damage, cancer, and other not so fun side effects. If you're enjoying the video so far, you can support this channel by pressing like, subscribing to Most Amazing, and ringing that notification bell. And number nine is mummy medicine. Back in the day, mummies were believed to possess mystical healing properties. From ancient Egypt to Europe to Renaissance period, people ground up these preserved bodies into powders or potions, thinking that they could cure anything from headaches to broken bones. Who would have thought that ancient Egyptian pharmacies would sell mummy juice? Now, you might be wondering why on earth would anyone think that ground out mummies could heal them? Well, it all came down to the concept of sympathetic magic. It was the idea that if you consumed a part of a mummy, which was considered to be timeless and preserved, you would gain some of its life force and longevity. Life force from an unalive thing. Yeah. Mummy medicine wasn't just ingested, it was also used topically. People would mix the mummy powder with various substances and apply it to wounds or injuries. It was believed to possess some mystical healing powers that could speed up the recovery process, but here's the kicker. They weren't just using any mummies. No, they had a hierarchy. You see, the best mummies were thought to come from executed criminals. And if you're wondering why, well, it was believed that the unfortunate life circumstances imbued them with extra potency. Plus, if you think that this was just an old world thing, think again because mummy medicine managed to stick around until the early 20th century. So next time you visit a museum and see a mummy on display, just remember that thing might have been a key ingredient in someone's headache remedy. Weird, right? At number eight, the electric eel pain relief. Oh boy. When it comes to fighting relief from pain, humanity has been pretty creative, but have you ever heard of using electric eels for your pain? So picture this, it's way back in ancient Rome, and you're suffering from some nasty pain. I don't know, maybe you've been carrying bricks on your back all day for that new cathedral. Now you're in the midst of ancient history, my friends, so instead of popping an Advil or calling your family doctor, you find yourself a trusty electric eel. These eels with their electric charges were believed to possess mystical properties. The idea was that letting some of these aquatic shockers zap you, your pain would somehow I'll just disappear. Now it might seem like a bizarre way to handle pain, but as with everything the Romans did, there's a hint of logic behind it. You see, electric eels use electric shots in the wild to navigate and hunt, and some folks thought that by harnessing this natural electric power, you could somehow overwhelm and reset your body's pain signals. Plus, who wouldn't want to be the first in line for a massage from a thunderfish, am I right? But of course, this practice raises more questions than it answers. Did it actually work? Was it safe? And more importantly, did the cure end up being worse than the ailment? Personally, I wouldn't want to test and find out. At number seven is the smoke enema. Oh boy. Ah, smoke enemas. Quite a head turner when it comes to weird medical practices of the past. You see, throughout history, people have come up with some pretty creative ways to treat various ailments. And I mean, either creative or insane, but I'll let you decide that for yourself down in the comments. Now picture this. It's the 18th century and someone is experiencing, say, a near drowning incident. And what do you do? Well, according to medical practices at the time, the answer would be to introduce tobacco smoke into the rectum. Yeah, you heard me right, where the sun don't usually shine. The idea behind this was that the smoke would supposedly warm up the body and simulate respiration from your booty? This practice gained quite a following, and even a special gadget called the Tobacco Smoke Enema Apparatus was invented for this very purpose. It was basically a bellows connected with a tube that was inserted into the, well, where it shouldn't go, allowing for the smoke to be blown in. While the smoke enema might sound like the kind of quirky solution that would only come from a different era, it's important to note that it wasn't widely accepted or successful as some other treatments. Medical minds at the time eventually realized that this practice wasn't as effective as they had initially hoped, and gradually it went up in smoke, so to speak. At number six, spider webs for wound dressing. Long ago, in a time before the wonders of modern medicine, people had to make do with what nature provided, and apparently, nature's architects, spiders, 
providers were considered quite the medical marvels. Now the concept is surprisingly straightforward. When someone suffered a minor cut or wound, instead of reaching for the nearest bandage, which hadn't been invented yet, they would apply a spider web to the injury. Why you might ask? Well, spider silk, as it turns out, possesses some rather unique properties. It's incredibly lightweight, yet remarkably strong, and is known for its ability to repel water. This made it an interesting choice for wound care, as the silk's fine structure could potentially create a barrier that kept out dirt and other contaminants while simultaneously still allowing the wound to breathe. But before you go on searching for spiders to create your own DIY wound dressing, let's acknowledge the downsides. Firstly, not all spider silk is created equal. Some spiders produce silk with potential antibacterial properties, while others might do the opposite. So on that note, there's the issue of sanitation. Let's just say those cobwebs you find in the attic might not be the most sterile choice to apply on your open wound. In the grand scheme of things, the idea of using a spider as wound dressings might be more of an interesting historical tidbit than a practical solution in today's world. Modern medicine has thankfully provided us with a plethora of sterile, advanced wound care options that leave the arachnids to their web building pursuits. At number five is the tapeworm diet. Oh boy. Back in the early 20th century, some folks believed that having a tapeworm was the ultimate weight loss solution. The idea was that this unwelcome guest would munch away at your ingested goodies, leaving you slimmer without really cutting back on the snacks. But of course, reality rarely agrees with such bizarre notions. This diet often led to some malnutrition on account of the fact that you have a literal worm in your intestines absorbing all your nutrients for you. There is also the possibility of infection on account of the fact that you have a literal worm in your intestines pooping as it pleases, as well as a whole breadth of seriously unpleasant side effects. Not on account of the fact that you have a literal worm inside of your intestines, I mean, come on you guys! Isn't is it that hard to see why this is a problem? Not to mention that once you invited these freeloaders into your gut, getting them out is a whole new ordeal. So while tapping into a tapeworm might sound like the stuff of science fiction, it's a reminder that even in the pursuit of health and beauty, a little freaking common sense goes a long way. At number four, ah, the Roman times, a land of togas, gladiators, and ingesting urine? Oh god, it just keeps getting worse. The ancient Romans were known for their ingenuity, but they also had some rather peculiar medical practices hanging up their tunics. Pun not intended. Now don't be weird or anything, they weren't just consuming any urine, only urine of certain individuals were said to hold magical healing properties. This practice, known as urotherapy, involved applying urine to wounds, gargling it for oral health care and teeth whitening, and using it as an ingredient in various remedies. Now before you wrinkle your nose in disbelief, let's delve into the logic, or lack thereof. Romans believed that urine carried the secrets to a person's health. They would examine its color, taste, and even smell to diagnose illnesses. They had specific urinals for the purpose, designed to catch the precious liquid and let doctors perform their analysis with the seriousness of a modern day lab technician. But wait, it gets even weirder. Some Romans took this to a whole new level. See, Emperor Nero, for instance, reportedly used young boys urine to keep his skin looking radiant. And if that wasn't enough, they even had manuals, yes, actual books on the art of uroscopy, the skill of reading pee like it's some kind of mystical scroll. So the next time you raise an eyebrow to modern medicine, just remember, at least we're not Doing that, the ancient Romans may have left us with some impressive architecture, but their medical advice? Oh boy. And number three is morphine. In the late 1800s, a new wonder drug emerged, morphine. Physicians hailed it as a magic wand against pain, disease, and discomfort. But here's the catch. While it might have provided temporary relief, it was far from a magic cure. Opium, as you may know, is highly addictive and can have some rather unpleasant side effects. So what began as a medical miracle turned into a nationwide nightmare. By 1895, the opiate addiction had gripped one in 200 Americans. The Civil War inadvertently launched an opiate epidemic with the hypodermic syringe becoming a go-to temptation for both doctors and patients alike. The addiction crisis peaked in 1895, prompting a slow reversal. Advances in medicine, education, and regulation began to unshackle society from the opiate grip. Opium dens and smoking emerged, changing societal perceptions in the face of addiction. Laws evolved from regulation to prohibition to treatment, and the allure of quick relief reminds us to tread carefully. At number two, a practice that might just leave you scratching your head, trepanation, the ancient technique of drilling a hole into the skull. Now, 
before you wince too hard, let's explore why people would actually voluntarily undergo this procedure. Back in the day, trepanation was believed to treat a variety of ailments from headaches to epilepsy to, well, letting out demons. Think of it as the let's let the bad stuff out approach to medicine. Kind of like installing a pressure valve for your brain, but with more drilling and less engineering. Ancient civilizations like the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Incas all had their take on this practice. They used a range of tools from flint to bronze to carefully bore holes into the noggin. But the question remains, did it work? Well, evidence suggests that some people actually survived this procedure with archaeological finds showing evidence of healed skull openings, which is pretty impressive considering the tools and, you know, lack of modern medicine or any anesthesia whatsoever. But let's not kid ourselves, this was still a risky game of chance, but before you grab your drill and start, you know, thinking of a career change, let's remember that trepanation scientific validity is, well, a bit holy. Like, these genes should be 50% off holy, not sew those genes up before you're late for church holy, just to clarify. At number one is maggot therapy, the worst one. Maggot therapy, also known as larval therapy, was a rather unconventional method used in the past for treating various ailments. Back in the day, doctors would intentionally introduce maggots onto wounds. Why, you ask? Well, as it turns out, these creepy crawlies had a peculiar talent. Maggots have an appetite for dead tissue. They munch away on the necrotic, infected parts of a wound, leaving the healthy tissue untouched. Kind of like a tiny cleanup crew crawling on your skin. <laughs> the practice might seem bizarre to us now, but it had a surprise surprisingly practical rationale. History records suggest that maggot therapy dates back to ancient times with reports of its use in cultures like the Mayans and the Aboriginal peoples of Australia. However, it gained even more popularity during the 19th century, especially during times of war when infections and gangrene were rampant. But here's the twist. Maggot therapy has actually found a place in modern medicine too. In controlled and sterile environments, medical maggots, yup, Medical maggots are bred and used to actually clean wounds, promote healing, and prevent infections. These maggots are certified clean, not the ones you'd find in your backyard. So there you have it. Maggot therapy might give you the heebie-jeebies, but it's a prime example of how unconventional methods can sometimes lead to surprisingly medical breakthroughs. However, personally, I'd rather just perish. And we're starting things off with a, a weird one. Did you know that there is one instance of a person winning a race after they died? Frank Hayes was a horse trainer and jockey who in 1923 entered a race at Belmont Park Racetrack in New York. The horse was named Sweet Kiss, but got a new nickname after the race was over, the Sweet Kiss of Death, and it never raced again. And that's because midway through the race, Frank Hayes suffered a heart attack and died on his horse. But Sweet Kiss crossed the finish line and won the race. The folks went down to congratulate him, and that's when they noticed his body was slumped over. He was pronounced dead almost immediately. Hayes had been under tremendous pressure to cut weight for the race. Supposedly, he'd gone from 142 pounds to 130 in a very short span of time. Some articles even say he'd lost the weight in just 24 hours. I don't think that's possible. But regardless, he definitely lost it far faster than he should have. And number nine, we have helium. Apparently, Earth is running out of it. This is a bit of an issue because helium has a big role in various technologies. There's a growing demand for helium. It's used in MRI scanners, semiconductor manufacturing, and scientific research, and, and we're using it faster than it can be extracted. Helium is actually abundant in the universe, but it escapes Earth's atmosphere due to its lightness and uh, just migrates into space. As a result, our supply here on Earth is finite and non-renewable. Right now, researchers are exploring methods of helium production, like capturing it from the atmosphere, although that process is pretty costly and pretty challenging. I used to get really freaked out by stuff like this, but I don't know, now I'm just like, what am I supposed to do about it? Number eight, tersoriums. What is a torsorium, you ask? Well, this was a tool used in ancient Rome. You had a stick with a sea sponge on the end, looking a lot like a toilet brush. But these weren't used to clean inanimate objects. These were used to clean the rear end, basically toilet paper before toilet paper uh, existed. Now, this doesn't sound all that gross at first. Nothing wrong with using a sponge to clean your butt. But when you consider the fact that these things were shared in public restrooms, yeah, that's pretty revolting. Now, it would be dunked in a barrel of water and vinegar afterwards to clean it off, but I mean, still, not sure how effective that would really be. And even if it was, let's just say that vinegar cleansed the thing completely. Just the idea, the principle alone, 
of scrubbing your butt with something that who knows who else also used to scrub theirs. I don't care how supposedly clean it is. That should be for personal use only. I mean, just like your everyday loofah. All you do is scrub your body with that thing, parts of your body that are far more clean than back there, uh, and I still only want to use mine. So the idea of this uh, makes me sick. Let's stick around in ancient Rome for a bit, talking about their cure for epilepsy. Gladiator blood. Uh, it's pretty well known that gladiators were seen as these larger than life heroic figures, almost like superheroes of the time. And without any concrete medical understanding of epilepsy, it was believed that the life juice of a fallen gladiator would be drunk by someone suffering from the mysterious disorder to help cure them of it. This was most likely because gladiators were very strong and healthy, so drinking their red stuff uh, was believed to maybe be a bit of an elixir, consuming their life force to gain some of the strength that they had in life. Sometimes the gladiator's liver would be eaten too. Now, of course, this didn't actually work. I'm not sure how long this practice went on before they would have realized that, but maybe there was a bit of a ceremonial aspect to it as well. This one is pretty gross, but not all that shocking, to be honest. Like, who wouldn't want to consume parts of a super elite sports hero when they die brutally right in front of your eyes, right? We all wish we could do that. Number six. Genghis Khan. Uh, Genghis Khan helped the environment. Uh, ruling from 1206 to 1227, founded the Mongol Empire through conquests across Asia and Europe. His leadership united nomadic tribes and created a pretty vast empire stretching from China to Eastern Europe. He was absolutely brutal, responsible for the deaths of an estimated 40 million people. According to a study by the Carnegie Institution for Science Departments of Global Energy, he and his army's destructive massacres were so significant that they may have actually reduced the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. This is because areas used for farmland or land that was once populated by people was allowed to grow back into lush forests, eliminating carbon by 700 million tons from the atmosphere. Now, did Genghis Khan do this intentionally? Of course not, but it just goes to show that even when things look completely dark and messed up, I don't know, sometimes there's a bit of good that can come from it, I guess. And at number five, we have the Dancing Plague. The Dancing Plague of 1518 is a very bizarre event that occurred in Strasbourg, France. During the summer of that year, a woman known as Frau Trophy began dancing on uncontrollably in the streets. She just wouldn't stop and within days other people started to like join in and eventually formed into this mass of dancers. This event lasted for weeks with a number of participants growing to several hundred and the dancers experienced exhaustion, dehydration and some even died. Doctors were pretty puzzled by the situation but determined it was caused by overheated blood and just sanctioned public areas for dancing to relieve the affected individuals. Nowadays, this is known as one of the most notorious cases of mass hysteria in history, an instance of mass psychogenic illness where uh, some kind of psychological trigger leads to physical symptoms in a large group of people at once. But even till this day, no definitive explanation has been reached as to how this started and what was really going on here. The story has always given me the creeps, though. I wonder what I would do in this situation, right? Would I just look at them all dancing and scratch my head and then continue on with my day? Or would I become afflicted and join in? That's the, that's the question. Number four, the Great Emu War. The American Civil War, World War I, World War II, Vietnam. We've all heard of these and many more famous wars from throughout history, but there's one that doesn't get mentioned all that much, but played a significant role in the history of Australia, the Great Emu War. Yes, the Australian population raged a war with these flightless birds, and spoiler alert, they lost. The unusual event took place in Australia during 1932. Following World War I, soldiers were given land in Western Australia to start to farm, but because of economic hardships, many of these farmers found themselves struggling faced with crop destruction and land degradation caused by large populations of emus. The farmers requested assistance from the government, and in response, the government deployed soldiers armed with machine to help curb the emu population. And the war commenced in November of 1932, but proved to be more challenging than anticipated. The emus were quick and agile, and the soldiers found it difficult to get rid of them. After weeks of this intense warfare, the government decided to just 
withdraw the troops. The emus survived the war relatively unscathed, and the campaign was deemed a complete failure. In at number three, we have the Green Children of Woolpit. This is a very bizarre tale. I, I'd never heard of this one before, and it was kind of a fun thing to read up on. The Green Children of Woolpit is a medieval legend that originated in the village of Woolpit, England during the 12th century. The story revolves around these two very odd young siblings, a brother and sister, who appeared in the village and, and they had green skin. They spoke in an unfamiliar language and wore strange clothing that the villagers weren't familiar with. They refused to eat food offered to them at first, but over time they started to adapt to their new environment and their skin gradually lost its green hue. They learned English and explained that they had come from a subterranean world where the sun never shined and everyone had green skin. They'd been uh, looking after their father's cattle apparently when they heard a loud noise and then suddenly found themselves in wool pit. And the brother eventually fell ill and died. Uh, the girl thrived though and went on to marry a man from the village and started a family. Uh, so where do you even start with a story like this? There are a lot of questions and only hypotheses about what actually happened here. One explanation is that the youngsters could have had some kind of condition that turned their skin green, right? Uh, perhaps they were migrants who were abandoned by their family and their language just wasn't known at the time. Of course, there are more outlandish theories though, like maybe they were from some long lost civilization that really did live underground. Some even speculate that they could have been an alien species from an alternate dimension. I mean, you, you know, just go nuts. Fun ideas, obviously there's nothing to really back that up. So all we know is that it's a very strange story from a very long time ago. And at number two, we have a type of fish with human looking teeth. So take a look at this. Uh, yeah, that's that's real. Someone didn't just put a set of dentures into a regular fish's mouth as a joke. This is a sheep shed fish. It uses those teeth to chomp down on the shells of the creatures it eats, like mussels and barnacles and oysters. It's definitely unsettling to look at. Reminds me of that picture that's floated around online for ages with the, uh, the teddy bear with the human teeth or the smiling dog that looks like it has uh, human teeth. It's just uncomfortable to look at. Don't like it. Finally, at our number one spot, we have the zombie ant fungus. Now, this is all gonna sound like something from a 1950s sci-fi monster movie, but it is very much real. There is a fungus called Ophiocordyceps unilateralis that is known to invade the bodies of ants, basically turning them into mindless zombies. When infected with a spore, the ant will start to behave strangely. Eventually, they'll be compelled to leave their nest and climb onto a plant stem. And then they'll ascend to the perfect height where there's the right humidity for the fungus to continue to grow. And the ant will cling to a leaf and remain there until a long stalk starts growing out of its head. And inside of this stalk are more spores, spores that will be released and rain down on the uninfected ants below, infecting them with the fungus too, and on and on it goes. Life as an insect sounds absolutely horrifying. Not only are you under constant threat of massive sized predators, but you also have to worry about a fungus that can grow inside your body and take over your brain? No thank you. And we're starting off this list with a short account posted to Reddit by user temporary value 421 It goes as follows. On a late walk, perhaps around 10, 30, 11, me and my sister took a path through a churchyard and approaching an enclave in the next field. However, we heard a scream. It was not like an animal nor human. The harmony of both high and deep was a rattling, like a man screaming crossed with a dying animal. There was a hedge on our way, obstructing vision. Whatever it was, it lay behind the hedge. We both looked forward and saw the silhouette of a tall, crooked thing. It was on two legs, though its back was hunched forward, its head long with jagged teeth. We didn't know what it was, nor did we want to. In any case, without speaking to each other, we ran in the opposite direction. Both of us. I am a coward, but my sister is tough as nails. She wouldn't simply run from an animal's cry, and yet we both ran. At our number nine spot, we have the bathing skinwalker. Uh, yeah, this is a weird one. Skinwalker or not, uh, this is a creepy little video. So it's nighttime here. We see some folks pointing flashlights at someone or something bathing in a pond. It then stands up and you can clearly see that 
whatever this figure is, it looks very shiny. I mean, like, sure, it was just sitting in a pond, but uh, even still, almost looks like the figure is coated in oil or, or mud or something. And there's something about the way it moves that just makes it look not quite human. The figure seems to have very long arms and it's hard to make out their face. Anyway, then it starts rushing towards the camera as our cameraman and his friends turn around and run. Number eight, Skinwalker in the Grass. This short video was uploaded to TikTok by user It's Louis Vuitton, and uh, the sighting is very brief, but it shows what looks to be some sort of pale, spindly creature rushing towards the camera. It could also just be an aggressive man out uh, in a field on his own, which is scary uh, as well. They were filming out of their car window, flashlight in hand, in search of a buck that they had just seen before starting to film. But the cameraman quickly realizes that uh, what they'd seen is not a buck, when a pale figure abruptly stands up out of the bushes before hunching over and like bolting towards the road. And that's where the video ends. Some might say it's a very convenient that the camera cuts before we can get a proper view of the thing, but if I was driving alone late at night and saw something like that, like booking it towards me, uh, I wouldn't be sticking around to film it either. Even if it was just like a lone naked man. You know, in fact, especially if it was a lone man. I'd risk capturing footage of a mythical creature, evil or not, but a crazed, nude human being, not quite worth the risk to reward. Number seven, dog head. This is another true story posted to Reddit by user the Putzulu. Anyway, it goes like this. I used to stay at my grandparents' house a lot when I was younger. They wanted to help out and such. They owned a 40 to 50 acre farm with their house about a quarter mile into the woods. It was summer and we were all going to bed. I always have had trouble falling asleep and was the only one awake and was returning from the bathroom to join my cousin on the top bunk with me in the bottom. The bedroom had one window facing a light post my grandparents had installed. I was just covering myself up when I saw something cast a shadow against the window curtain. Once, then twice. It was fast, but I could tell there was something moving outside. I crawl out of the bed, hugging the floor, already scared. I was about a foot from the closed curtain with my eye just above the windowsill. I stared out and nothing happened for a few seconds. Then I saw a figure cast a shadow onto the curtain. It looked like a big dog head. Long snout, tail, pointed ears. It stopped perfectly in the center of the window frame, then slowly turned its head to face me. Froze, but it then raised up a few inches to show its shoulders. I can only describe it as a wolf head on a human body. Then it turned away and moved on. People said I was young. It was only a nightmare. It wasn't. I remember it vividly. I forgot to mention that this window was about five feet up from the ground. It was my mother's old room as a child. And, and when I asked her if she ever saw anything, she paused for several seconds, began to speak, shook her head, and stuttered out a no. She knew the folklore and refused to speak and we dropped it, but I knew why she responded that way. Never mention them aloud. I can't explain this. I'm still scared to be alone at night there. Even typing this gives me goosebumps. Next up, we have a piece of supposed skinwalker footage posted to Reddit by user 123. This is a genuinely spooky uh, piece of footage. If it, if, if, if it is a hoax, uh, they did a damn good job. Whatever this creature is, it looks creepy as hell. It's hard to make out, but a lot of people say it looks like General Grievous uh, from Star Wars in the face uh, anyway. Not that you can really tell where this thing's face ends and its body begins. It seems to be crouching in someone's backyard, I guess. Then it gets up and you see that it's this big, hairy creature, possibly bipedal. I, uh, I hate it. Not something you would ever want to run into at any time of the day, let alone in the dead of night. Only thing uh, that I do find suspect about this video is that someone would just be like standing there all cool just filming this thing uh, and instead of immediately running inside and in my case having a heart attack. But you know, cool video nonetheless. 
Number five, the Amarillo Zoo creature. This is an image you've likely seen before. It really made the rounds on the internet for a while. It's an image captured on a security camera at the Amarillo Zoo in Texas. Now, if you're thinking it's just an animal from the zoo on its hind legs for some reason, uh, this creature is roaming around on the outside of the zoo. A lot of folks on the interwebs say this looks like a werewolf. Sonic the Hedgehog comes up a lot, although if that's what Sonic looked like in real life, uh, it'd be far less charming than he is in the video games, but if we're talking about a humanoid that can take on an animal form, this is definitely, it fits the bill. A bipedal dog or wolf-like creature, definitely giving me some Skinwalker vibes. What do you think though? Is it just a hoax? Is it real, but something totally innocuous? Post your thoughts in the comments. Number four, dogs with human heads. Now, I'm not really sold fully on this next story uh, being real, but at the end of the day, who knows? If there's one thing I've learned working on this channel, it's that a lot of bizarre stuff goes on on our uh, beautiful planet, plus dogs with human heads. That is a title that immediately grabbed my attention. So, this account was posted to Reddit by user Chillybot, and it, it goes something like this. At about 12, 12 midnight, my mother heard something hit our front door. This caused my older sister and my mom to be awake at the same time. My sister's dog left her room and barked at the door. But because no further banging was heard, no one came to the front door to further check what the noise was. After my sister's dog stopped barking, my sister then heard the laughing of two small girls. The laughing was loud enough for my other sister, whose room is across from my older sister's room, to be awakened by it. My older sister decided to check outside her window and saw two white-looking dogs who were the cause of the laughing children's voices. After closely watching the two creatures, she then noticed that the two white dogs had human heads with flowing human-like hair. They laughed their way down the block, leaving my sister afraid. You know, whether that's true or not, like a dog laughing like a kid with a human head, I don't know what the hell I'm saying right now, but that is uh, a creepy image. Number three, the abandoned mineshaft Skinwalker. This next clip is just a fantastic video uploaded to YouTube by Danny Donahue. Uh, worth checking out his channel. He has some very cool work on there. And this video is just well done. So, two people are standing outside this abandoned mine shaft. They hear this strange sound, almost like an elk call. Deciding to go full horror movie cliche, they decide to go inside the mine to see what it is. And it's eerily quiet. Just an empty tunnel shrouded in shadow. That is until this thing pops out. A slender pale figure with glowing eyes. Just very effective. Number two, Coyote. This next Skinwalker account was posted to Reddit by a now deleted user, but it goes as follows. Let me start off by saying my husband is native, and this happened about six years before I met him. My ex-husband was stationed in San Diego, and I flew out there to visit him. I found a hotel that wasn't far from the base and close to food and, and whatnot. I went out to get some food and then walked back to the hotel since it wasn't far. Unfortunately, with my horrible scent of direction, I got lost and ended up near a wooded area. But there was a highway also nearby. I was getting close to sunset and I started seeing sets of shining eyes and I thought they were just coyotes. I'm not afraid of much. After about 20 minutes, one set of shining eyes got closer, and I saw it was a coyote. I watched Steve Irwin as a teenager and remembered that if you make yourself appear bigger and louder than you actually are, they'll usually just run off. So I started clapping my hands and shouting. This one, however, didn't. It stood up and started walking like a person. I've never run away from something so fast. It never followed me and I wasn't gonna stick around to find out what it was. It wasn't until I met my current husband that I found out what it was and the look on his face when I told him this story, he went pale. He never said anything, he just kinda nodded like he understood. Finally, we have Skinwalker Ranch. You can't really do a Skinwalker video without mentioning this hotbed of strange activity. All kinds of weird stuff goes on here. For starters, as the name suggests, there are strange creatures that have been reported in the area who many believe to be the malevolent entities known as Skinwalkers. Witnesses at Skinwalker Ranch have reported 
very eerie encounters with these beings, describing creatures re resembling wolves, coyotes, or other animals, but displaying these uncanny level of intelligence and unnatural physical abilities. They've been seen peering into windows, mimicking human voices, and even pursuing those who come too close. But, of course, in addition to all the skinwalker stuff going on, the ranch is a hotbed for other unexplained phenomena, mysterious cattle mutilations, where animals are found with precise surgical-like incisions and missing organs. This could be the work of skinwalkers as well, though. And of course, you get strange lights and UFO sightings regularly illuminating the night sky over the area. Coming in at number 10 is Henry Hudson. One of the most famous explorers of all time, Hudson's surname is still heard in the huge bay in eastern Canada and in the Hudson River in New York. He was a brave traveler as he toured Greenland and the Silvard Archipelago of the glacial Arctic Ocean. His final great expedition was to North America mainland. In 1610, Henry set his sail on his ship, Discovery, never knowing he was not to return. Nearly two months later, after several quarrels among the crew, a riot resulted in Henry, his son John, and eight loyal crew members being abandoned to a small boat near the Diggs Island. Now, For some time, the Discovery continued sailing, but it too soon withdrew its sails, and the unfortunate crew was abandoned to fate. Now, This was the last time Henry Hudson was seen alive in a small boat in a bay that bears his name even today. Now, Did they meet other people on the island? Did they starve to death? No one quite knows, and I don't think we ever will. Number 9. Giovanni Cabato It's said that Giovanni Cabato, an Italian navigator born in 1450, was the first European to reach the coast of North America after the Vikings. On his first voyage, the Italian left Bristol, England and sailed to the Atlantic in search of the Lost Island, on which he would supposedly find dyes of great value, but the search failed. On his second voyage, he arrived at Cape Bonavista in New Foundland and returned to England proclaiming the territory as part of the British Empire. Now This entitled him to great fame and great fortune. In 1478, he sailed from the British Isles with five ships under his command en route to northern Canada. Now The Spanish envoy in London reported in July that one of the ships had been caught in a storm and been forced to return to land in Ireland, but that Giovanni and the four other ships had continued on. For centuries, no other records were found to relate to this expedition as it was long believed believe that Giovanni and his fleet were lost at sea. It's not known whether he died during the voyage, returned safely and died shortly after, or arrived in the Americas and chose to remain there, perhaps remaining with the indigenous people. What happened is forever a mystery. Number 8. Roald Amundsen One of Norway's most beloved 20th century explorers, Roald Amundsen, was born there and trained as a sailor. He explored the frozen lands of the north as his first trip to unquestionably reach the North Pole, and he led expeditions to Antarctica again for the first time reaching the South Pole. Now, A lover of these frozen lands, he disappeared on June 18, 1928, a hero while flying over the Arctic in an attempt to rescue three passengers from another plane crash. It's assumed that Roald and his crew died in a plane wreck or died shortly afterward. The search for his team was called off in September 1928 by the Norwegian government and the bodies were never found. Number 7. Gaspar Court Real. A Portuguese explorer who undertook an expedition to Greenland in 1500, Gaspar Court Real soon after embarked in the direction of Newfoundland or Labrador Bay. At some point, he sent back three of his four ships, including one led by his brother, Miguel, and then disappeared into the sea forever. Then in 1502, Miguel made another trip to the area where his brother had disappeared, but also suffered the same fate. His ship, too, was lost to the cold northern sea. One theory based on Latin inscriptions found in Massachusetts asserts that Miguel may have come ashore and lived at least nine more years in North America, but it's unknown what caused them to disappear and what actually happened. Number 6. Naomi Irma Naomi Irma was part of the first Japanese team to climb Mount Everest in 1970. They would have been the first Japanese team to reach the summit had it not been for him allowing one of his companions, an older man, to go ahead. An alpinist, Naomi had already conquered the highest peaks on five continents and was the 
first person to reach the North Pole alone, while creating a legend of modern exploration. In 1984, he set out on an expedition to climb Mount McKinley in Alaska in an attempt to become the first man to climb that peak alone and during the winter. He's known for having to reach the summit, but he never returned. Some objects that belonged to Naomi, including a diary, were found in a snow cave, but his body was never recovered, and the exact circumstances of his death have never been revealed. Number five. Percy Fawcett. An English military officer, archaeologist, and explorer, Percy Fawcett was one of the first to map the enormous Amazon rainforest. The expedition of his life, though, happened in the 1920s when he sought the mythical lost city of El Dorado, which he'd nicknamed the Lost City of Z. In 1925, Percy, his son, and a friend entered the Brazilian region of Mato Grosso. A few days later, they sent their native guides back with their latest letters, including one from Percy to his wife Nina, in which he said, You need have have no fear of any failure. But after this, they were never seen again. The disappearance generated legends of the fate of Percy and his companions, and many said that they joined a tribe in the region, while others claimed that they died, and that they'd even found some mystical commune. The most credible explanation was by a journalist, David Grant, who in 2005 unveiled a legend still circulating among the Kalapala tribe, which recounted that Percy had arrived in the land, but had ignored warnings of a hostile tribe in the area. Number 4. Ludwig Leichhardt A famous German scientist and explorer, Ludwig Leichhardt led several expeditions into the interior of Australia. On one occasion, he had been declared dead, only to return 18 months later, safe and sound, with a wealth of information about his discoveries. Now, His final and most ambitious expedition in 1848 included 7 men, 50 head of cattle, 20 mules, 7 horses, and sufficient supplies. He intended to cross the Australian desert from east to west but the expedition never reached its destination. The only trace that was found of the trip was a small plaque bearing Ludwig's name, which had allegedly been attached to his rifle. Later, trees marked with an L, a custom by which the explorer marked his roots, were found, but nothing more. Ludwig's true destiny, like that of his men, will surely remain buried in the sands of the great Australian desert. Number 3. Amelia Earhart Amelia Earhart was an American hero and one of the most famous people on the planet. In 1932, a According to the National Women's History Museum, Amelia became the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean unaccompanied, and she was awarded the Cross of the French Legion of Honor and the American Distinguished Flying Cross, among other achievements. Now, in 1937, she set out on a journey that would prove ambitious and mysterious. She aimed to be the first woman to fly all the way around the globe. Now, alongside her navigator Fred Noonan, she departed Miami on June 1st, and by July 2nd, they made it to New Guinea with plans to hit Howland. Island, a small uninhabited landmass between Hawaii and Australia. Now, some time en route, Amelia, dealing with poor weather and low fuel, lost contact with the Coast Guard liaison. Her plane never landed and it was never discovered. Nor were Amelia or Fred, despite a joint Coast Guard and Navy search effort that encompassed 250,000 square miles. Number two, Jean Francois de Gallup Le Perouse. In 1785, Francis's King Louis XVI dispatched the explorer Jean. Francois de Gallup La Perouse on a grand around the world map making expedition. He spent the next few years surveying the coastlines of California, Alaska, Russia, Japan, Korea, and the Philippines. He reached Australia in 1788, but after leaving Bonnet Bay, his fleet disappeared. A rescue expedition arrived in 1791, but it found no trace of Jean Francois, his two ships, or his 225 crew members. It was nearly 40 years before any evidence of the explosion. Fate emerged. In 1826, an Irish sea captain named Peter Dillon learned from natives that a pair of ships had once sunk near the island of Vanikoro. After sailing to the site, Peter recovered anchors and other wreckage, later confirmed to belong to Jean Francois's two ships. Now, in a bizarre twist, the locals also claimed that some of the men, including the group's chief, had survived on the island for some time before building a ramshackle boat and heading out to sea. Now, if this mysterious chief was indeed Jean Francois, it would mean the doomed navigator survived for several years longer than was originally believed, but it seems like we'll never know. Coming in at number one is Igor Dyatlov. The Dyatlov Pass incident was an event in which nine Soviet hikers died in the northern Ural Mountains between February 1st and 2nd, 1959, under uncertain circumstances. Now, a creepy photo shows the determined group traversing the harsh terrain just before they met their fate on the night of February 1st. Now, what happened? Well, the experienced trekking group 
group from the Ural Polytechnical Institute, led by Igor Dyatlov, had established a camp in the Russian SFSR of the Soviet Union. Overnight, something caused them to cut their way out of their tent and flee the campsite while inadequately dressed for the heavy snowfall and sub zero temperatures. Now, after the group's bodies were discovered, an investigation by Soviet authorities determined that six of them had died from hypothermia, while the other three had died by physical trauma. One victim had major skull damage, two had severe chest trauma, and another had a small crack in his skull. Four of the bodies were found laying in running water in a creek, and three of those four had damaged soft tissue of the head and face, and two of the bodies had missing eyes, one had a missing tongue, and one had missing eyebrows. Now, no one's really too sure what happened to them and why it happened either, but it's just extremely strange. At number 10, the giant of Castle No. Our first stop is the giant of Castle No, discovered in 1890 by George Voucher de la Pouge. Sorry, I definitely butchered that. This tale revolves around three bone fragments, a humerus, a tibia, and a femoral midshaft. According to these discoveries, these fossils might just belong to one of the mightiest humans ever documented. At an astounding stature of 11 feet and 6 inches tall. Published in the Journal of Nature, George's findings point to the Neolithic period, deep within a Bronze Age burial tulumus. The bones, unquestionably human despite their colossal size, received detailed scrutiny. A femur shaft boasting 14 centimeters in length and 16 in circumference, a tibia fragment measuring 26 centimeters, and a peculiar lower humerus piece. Experts at the University of Montpellier meticulously studied these massive bones, and so the enigma of the giant of Castle No remains a towering testament to history's secrets. If you're enjoying the video so far, you can support this channel by pressing like, subscribing to Most Amazing, and ringing that notification bell. At number 9 is Emperor Maximus. Emperor Gallius Julius Verus Maximus Augustus, or Maximus Thrax, stands tall in history as a colossal figure with the brutal reign that rattled the Roman Empire, who reads like a historical supervillain, what with his name, stature, and position. Born in 173 AD, he climbed the military ladder to seize power, reflecting his tumultuous era. At 8 feet tall, his imposing stature set him apart, a physical embodiment of sheer strength. His loyalty winning blend of military and physical prowess propelled him to the imperial throne in 235 AD, defying Rome's traditional aristocracy. But his role was plunged into a nightmare of cruelty and dread. Emerging from a common soldier origin seemed to shape his chilling cruelty, ruling as a despot with an iron fist. Oppression weighed heavy on his subjects, burdened by taxing labor that drained their life force. As he focused outward, uprising simmered within. In 238 AD, a coalition of anger coalesced against him, culminating in a storm of conflict and chaos, marking the climax of Maximus's dark saga. One can only wonder how they confronted this eight-foot-tall tyrant. At number eight is Cave Remains. Venturing into the obscure corners of history, we uncover a perplexing tale of a forgotten giant. Discovered in the enigmatic depths of a flooded cave system in Mexico's Caribbean coast, a prehistoric human skeleton emerges from the shadows, veiled in mystery. Submerged beneath 26 feet of water and cloaked by sediment, this relic of the past has remained concealed for over 8,000 years, concealed by the very forces that once shaped it. Archaeologist Octavio Del Rio, alongside his partners, Octavio Del Rio encountered this ancient enigma while exploring the cave's labyrinth passages. The skull shattered, the skeleton fragmented, it raises puzzling questions. Was this a deliberate resting place or the site of an untimely demise? As the Mexican government plans a high-speed tourist train through the nearby jungle, this discovery adds an intriguing layer to the region's history. But the story doesn't end there. Delving further, we find ourselves amidst the cenotes, sinkhole caves that have yielded some of North America's oldest human remains. Unraveling the true age of this submerged sentinel requires meticulous study, dating, photographic analysis, and careful collection. Yet as we piece together the past, one fact remains clear. This real-life giant secrets have broken free from the clutches of time, inviting us to rewrite history's narrative. At number seven is the seven-foot skeletons. Over a thousand accounts of massive seven-foot tall and even taller skeletons have been unearthed from ancient burial sites across North America. Yeah, that's right, not one or two, but thousands. These reports span a period of around two centuries and have been meticulously documented in various sources. They newspapers, country histories, diaries, and scientific journals, just to name a few. Now, these skeletons aren't just of your run-of-the-mill variety. We're talking double rows of teeth, jaw bones that could practically engulf a person's face, and elongated skulls that defy the norm. Scientists have acknowledged that at least 17 of these towering skeletons in their annual reports. Additionally, a skull with a mind-boggling 36-inch circumference was found, where the average human skull is around 20 inches. It's all there in black and white, buried within the annals of history. But the question
question is, why are we hearing more about these colossal anomalies? At number six, a new species. In 2021, a colossal revelation was made. A newly discovered species, a two meter long skull of an ichthyoscor rewrote the pages of history. Forget human giants, these giants ruled the waves. Long before dinosaurs roamed, these aquatic reptiles dominated, boasting remarkable size and diversity. Intriguingly, they emerged from an enigmatic group of land-based reptiles defying expectations with their air-breathing prowess. Scientists explain that these fish saurians held from an era even predating dinosaurs. Unearthed from Nevada's Fossil Hill member, this remarkably preserved giant skull and body parts date back to the Middle Jurassic around 247 million years ago. Imagine a colossal creature larger than a sperm whale reigning over the land and sea, the Earth's first known giant rewriting our understanding of ancient enormity. At number five, Goliath. A towering Philistine warrior of over nine feet, Goliath embodies terror and challenges courage itself. Clad in metal and leather, his form loomed over battlefields, exuding malevolence that shook even valiant warriors. But then comes David, armed with a slingshot and audacious faith. Facing this monstrous foe, David's defiance baffles logic. He steps forth, fires a rock, and miraculously hits Goliath square in the face. Scientists suggest that Goliath's colossal size might have been due to a vulnerability inducing hormone syndrome. A single rock to the forehead does the trick and Goliath falls. This tale birthed the first underdog story with David overcoming impossible odds. While giants may be rare today, these stories remind us of our smallness in the universe. At number four, ancient burial mounds. The following puns are in fact intended. Digging into the past, we unearth a peculiar puzzle that historians might not be so eager to talk about, real life giants. Now I'm not talking about Jack of the Beanstalk here, but rather ancient burial mounds in America that held a giant surprise. In the late 1800s New England, skeletons were uncovered measuring a towering seven to 10 feet. These were no small town tales. Credible newspapers of the time reported these finds, and it doesn't stop there. Giant skeletons popped up like surprises in a storybook all across America. But the giant saga doesn't confine itself to the land of stars and stripes. Travel to Sardinia and you'll find whispers of tombs hiding the bones of giants towering over 12 meters tall. Now things get even more interesting. Allegedly the Smithsonian, that grand institution of knowledge, had a curious interest in purchasing these giant remains from civilizations. But these bones vanished into thin air. A parallel mystery unfolds in Sardinia as well, where farmers stumbled upon colossal bones and dutifully handed them over to authorities, only to find silence in return. So are we just tall tales away from rewriting history? The enigma of these real life giants remains a riddle yet to be solved. At number three, Alton the Giant. Born in 1918, Robert Waldo soared to over eight feet, 11 inches due to an overactive pituitary gland. His extraordinary growth was both a wonder and a burden. Early on, he outgrew his peers, and by age eight, he stood at six foot, two inches. But this gigantism came with complications. Finding fitting clothes and dealing with constant pain due to his enormous frame were just some of his struggles. Fame wasn't kind either, as he was parodied like a circus act overshadowing his humanity. Despite trying to lead a normal life, Life and engaging in charity work, while those mental and emotional well-being deteriorated. Tragically, an infection from an ill-fitting leg brace led to his demise at 22. At number two is John Rogan. Not to be not to be confused with Joe Rogan, the podcaster who dwarfs in comparison. Meet John Rogan, a name less known than his towering height. Born in 1967, he grew to an astounding eight feet nine and a half inches, earning him the title of the second tallest person in history, just after Robert Waldo. Hailing from Tennessee and being the fourth amid 12 siblings, his growth was rapid but came at a cost. Ankylosis, a condition causing joint rigidity, struck him in 1882, rendering him unable to walk. However, John didn't let this hinder his livelihood. Stationed at a train station, he supported himself by selling portraits and postcards. Despite circus and sideshow offers, he declined maintaining his dignity. Legend has it that he used a goat pulled cart as a wheelchair, always drawing attention not only due to his height, but also his large hearted personality. There's even a record indicating his giant lineage from his maternal grandfather, possibly suggesting a genetic link. John lived until 1905, leaving behind a legacy that refuses to stand in anyone else's shadows. And at number one, what were giants actually? Imagine a world where giants actually roamed the earth, not the kind with beanstalks or one-eyed creatures, but real life giants that history seems to have swept under the rug. See, back in the day before Skip and Uber Eats, our ancestors were the ultimate foodies, hunter-gatherers dining on a buffet of nature's bounty. This diverse menu, along with their semi-nomadic lifestyle, made them tall and robust, standing shoulder to shoulder with today's tallest folks. But then, bam, agriculture strutted in with its monoculture 
culture of wheat and occasional meat cameo, stringing us to Hobbit heights for the millennia. Now, agriculture took some time to spread across humanity, enough time for a huge height difference to develop between hunter-gatherer tribes and farming villages, and eventually tiny farmers would meet towering nomads. These agriculturalists side-eyed the hunters with their Flintstone-esque tools and their on-the-go lifestyle, all while munching on their fields and herds. To farmers, giants were brutish and boundary blind, traits now echoed in myths. So the myths of giants might be ancient memoirs of agrarian angst, highlighting the friction between farmers and foragers. In a world where size mattered, it seems like it was survival of the biggest. And we're starting out this list with Grigory Rasputin, born in 1869 in a small Siberian village. He grew up as a peasant. He was also a mystic and grew up to become quite close with the Russian royal family after seeming seemingly healed Alexei Nikolaevich, the son of Nicholas II and heir to the Russian throne. Alexei uh, was a hemophiliac, meaning his blood didn't clot properly, and Rasputin, after being called to the palace of Nicholas and Alexandra, seemed to ease his symptoms. This was miraculous, and the royal family put their full trust in this mysterious holy man who would go on to have sleeping with any woman he could within the palace, but he was also known to force himself on women. But because Nicholas and Alexandra were so enamored with his supposed power, any concern or report about him was completely written off. It seemed that everyone on the outside wanted the guy gone though, seeing how he was pulling Nicholas and Alexandra's strings, controlling them like puppets. And, and there were a number of attempts to take Rasputin's life, but this guy was hard to take down. He was stabbed and recovered, poisoned with cyanide which had no effect. He was shot and was seemingly dead before springing up like Michael Myers at the end of Halloween. He was then shot again before being wrapped up in a blanket and thrown in a river where he finally drowned. Number 9, Gil de Rey. Born in 1404, Gil de Rey was a French nobleman and a respected military leader, but he had a secret life. He was responsible for viciously taking the lives of countless young ones and was said to be a practitioner of black magic and conducted occult rituals, leading many to believe that he possessed otherworldly abilities. This guy was an absolute monster. If you want to talk about true evil, this is it right here. His servants, mostly young men, very young men, and other young ones around his castles started going missing, and rumors started to spread that Gil de Rey was disposing of them, something that turned out to be true when witnesses began seeing servants disposing of bodies. Many were afraid to speak out against him, though, due to the immense gap in class that was present at the time. He was finally arrested in 1440, though, and under the threat of excruciating punishment, he admitted to his crimes, actually revealing that he would take the lives of his victims in these dark occult-like rituals. Next on the list, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth Bathory, born August 7th, 1560, was a Hungarian noblewoman, notorious for being one of the most prolific female serial killers in history. She's, she's often remembered as the Blood Countess because of her horrifying crimes. Bathory was accused of tormenting and taking the lives of numerous young females. Her methods included severe beatings, burning, and disfigurement. And what she's most famous for, though, was her belief that bathing in her victim's blood would preserve her youth. It's said that she may have taken the lives of hundreds in her quest for eternal beauty. Her actions eventually caught the attention of authorities. In 1610, she was arrested and her accomplices were put on trial. And the accounts from witnesses and survivors painted a very chilling picture of her cruelty. She was never officially tried in court, but was confined to a windowless room in her castle until her death in 1614. Number 7, Aleister Crowley. Crowley, born in 1875, was an English occultist and ceremonial magician who founded the religion of Thelema. He was a prominent and very controversial guy, especially at the time, known as the Great Beast 666. He was an occultist 
writer, and ceremonial magician. A man of many mysteries and oddities. Crowley, Crowley was known for more than just his eccentric lifestyle though. One of the big questions surrounding him is whether he actually had any mystical powers or was just really good at talking the talk. Crowley wasn't shy about bragging that he could communicate with supernatural beings. He claimed to have a direct line to a being named Awas who supposedly dictated to him the book of the law, basically the bible of Thelema. Then there's the curious case of his rituals. Crowley was all about strange ceremonies often involving weird symbols and chants and even some bizarre uh, Practices. As to whether he was evil, I mean, you know, some would definitely say he was, but uh, yeah, certainly not like most of the others on this list. Like this next guy, for example. And at number six, Thug Baram. Thug Baram, born in 1765, became infamous as the ruthless leader of the Thuggy cult in India during the 18th and 19th centuries. The Thuggy were a secret criminal society that specialized in robbery and murder, targeting unsuspecting expecting travelers what made the thuggy particularly sinister was their method was their method of operation they would often befriend and gain the trust of their victims on the road only to then strangle them with a rummel a, a cloth and this kind of ritualistic fashion, allowing them to carry out their crimes discreetly. Baram was one of the most notorious thuggy leaders, believed to have taken the lives of hundreds. He actually admitted to witnessing 931 people die right in front of him, and that's not even counting the ones he had a direct hand in. Under his leadership, the thugs terrorized India for years with a well-organized network that spanned the country. He was eventually captured and put to death in 1840. Next, we have H. H. Holmes. Holmes was born in 1861 in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. Although he was highly intelligent from a young age, he displayed all your classic disturbing signs early on. He would capture and torture animals, cutting into them and performing strange experiments. Holmes, whose real name was Herman Webster Mudgett, not quite as intimidating sounding, committed crimes that were as horrifying as they were calculated. He constructed this nightmarish castle in Chicago, specifically equipped with secret passageways and like soundproof rooms and gas chambers, which were all made to assist assist with his gruesome crimes. He would lure numerous victims, mostly young women, surprise, surprise, into his property and once inside, they came face to face with unimaginable horrors, including excruciating torment, asphyxiation, and dissection. The exact number of his victims isn't 100% known, but it could be anywhere from just nine to over 200. I'm guessing it's somewhere in between. In 1896, he was finally convicted for his crimes and sentenced to death. Number four, Gil Garnier. Here we have a real life werewolf case, at least the closest thing uh, possible. Uh, Gil Garnier, aka the Hermit of St. Bonneau and the Werewolf of Dole was a reclusive man born at some point in the mid 1500s in France. He lived in an isolated home just outside the town of Dole. His new wife moved out to the home with him and it was at this point that something changed in Garnier. He had always hunted food for himself, but now having to provide for another person, it, it was difficult and this started driving a wedge between him and his wife and he started getting desperate. It was at this point that several young ones in the area started being found mauled to death with parts of their bodies having been eaten. Meaning this had to have been the work of some large animal, right? But it wasn't, it was Garnier. Garnier's crimes came to light when a group of traveling workers had spotted him eating the body of one of his victims in the dead of night. At first, they thought they were looking at a wolf. According to Garnier, he had been hunting one night when a ghostly figure came to him, telling him it would imbue him with the power to transform into a wolf, making it easy easier for him to hunt. Since that night, he had stalked and hunted a number of young people, most of which died as a result of his savage attacks. He was burnt at the stake in 1574, accused of lycanthropy and witchcraft. I don't know what it was with guys named Gills in uh, France back then, but uh, they didn't like young folks, apparently. Number three, Vlad the Impaler, the original vampire himself. Uh, if there's anyone in history that just feels like they stepped out of some portal from another dark dimension, it's this guy. 
Vlad was born in 1431. He was a tyrant renowned for his brutal methods of punishing enemies, often impaling them on long spikes. His reputation for cruelty gave rise to the legend that is Dracula, inspiring Bram Stoker's famous vampire novel. Alongside these gruesome acts, there are legends suggesting Vlad may have possessed otherworldly powers, tales in the kind of hint at his ability to control the weather, or summon dark forces, or even transform into a vampire-like creature. The line between fact and fiction often blurs with this guy. Some believe that his cruelty was more than human, that maybe he had something supernatural lurking inside him, some sort of dark entity from beyond. He just inspired this intense fear and awe in his time, and his brutality definitely unquestionable, but the idea of him being an actual vampire, most likely just legend, uh, but fun to imagine. And at number two, we have Jack the Ripper, a name everyone has heard before. One of the first cases uh, of the type of modern day serial killer we hear about all the time now, only this man was never identified. Jack the Ripper terrorized the Whitechapel district of London in 1888 and remains one of the most infamous figures in criminal history. His victims were taken out in the most gruesome ways possible. They looked like they had been mauled to death by a five 500 pound brown bear. A jack primarily targeted female workers of the night, brutally mutilating their bodies. The sheer level of ferocity of these attacks and the fact that he was never caught uh, really has fueled the theories and speculations over the years about him. He taunted the police with letters that were apparently from him signed as Jack the Ripper. There have been intensive investigations and a number of uh, suspects that have kind of come up over the years that could have been him, but his true identity has never been definitively proven. Finally, we have Heinrich Himmler. Heinrich Himmler was a high-ranking German official during World War II. He had a deep and disturbing fascination with the occult. He believed he could summon dark forces to help him shape a new world order and try to incorporate his beliefs into the ideology of the regime. He established a uh, research institute to explore ancient and supernatural phenomena. Under his direction, he conducted these expeditions to search for evidence of Aryan origins, looking into topics like ancient artifacts, astrology, folklore, and this interest extended to the dark and the occult as Himmler believed that tapping into these mystical forces would help the German forces gain more power and control. He promoted pseudo-scientific theories, obviously related to racial purity and mysticism, and saw the SS almost as this more modern day knightly kind of order. Uh, such a bizarre side of the Second World War. It feels like something out of Hellboy, but uh, this really was a thing. The German forces were really dabbling in this type of occult stuff at the time. Coming in at number 10 is Baron Von Toll. In the year 1900, geologist and explorer Baron Edward Von Toll was commissioned by the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences to lead a new Russian polar expedition to the Arctic to survey an archipelago called the New Siberian Islands. Specifically, he was to search for the mythical Sankov land to prove once and for all whether or not the island actually existed. This landmass had been first spotted 100 years earlier, and ever since then, Several explorers claimed to have seen it, including Von Toll himself during an earlier expedition. Now, this made him perfect for the mission, so in June of 1900, he sent off to the Arctic with a 19 man team aboard the Zarya. Unfortunately for Von Toll, Sanikov land did not exist, and this proved to be his undoing. After two years in the Arctic, his team gathered plenty of scientific data, but no sign of the elusive island. With the expedition coming to a close, Von Toll tried one last bold gamble. After the winter of 1902 passed, he and three crewmen left the Zarya and went on a separate journey, using sleighs and canoes to maneuver easier through the archipelago. They were supposed to meet with the rest of the team on Bennett Island, but the thick ice prevented the ship from getting anywhere close. From that point on, the fate of Von Toll and his three crewmen became a mystery. Months later, a search party found their camp on Bennett Island, along with several notes written by the explorer, but no trace of the men could ever be found. Number 9. Udoc 
Eudoxus of Cyzicus. Eudoxus of Cyzicus was a Greek navigator who explored the Arabian Sea. He failed to circumnavigate Africa from Europe in the second century BCE. Now he probably wasn't the first to attempt the journey, but he may have been the first one to get lost trying. He had already made two successful trips to India via the Red Sea for Egypt. It turns out during the second of these trips, Eudoxus was driven off course and landed somewhere on the east coast of Africa. There he found remnants of a shipwreck. Eudoxus concluded that it came from a ship that had rounded the southern tip of Africa and crashed. So he organized a fleet of three ships to leave from present day Cadiz in Spain. He ran aground on its first attempt, but that wasn't enough to convince him to call off the journey. After embarking on that second journey, he was never seen again. It turns out Eudoxus was centuries ahead of his time, and it wasn't until 1488 CE that Bartolomeo Diaz became the first European explorer confirmed to have rounded Africa's southernmost point. Number 8. John Franklin In 1845, explorer John Franklin left Britain with more than 100 crew members in a search of the Northwest Passage. His two ships, the HMS Terror and the HMS Erebus, disappeared in the Canadian Arctic. Later investigations determined that the vessels had become stranded in sea ice. After Captain Franklin died suddenly in 1847, his surviving crew abandoned the ships and set off to get help on foot. For decades, it was thought that the ships and their crews had vanished without a trace. Then in 2014, Inuit and Parks Canada archaeologists discovered the wreck of Erbius in the Victoria Strait. The Terror's remains were found off King William Island two years later in Terror Bay. Now, the discovery of these ships finally brought some closure to one of the greatest mysteries in Arctic exploration's history. Bones of the crew members have also been found, one of which has been identified using their descendants' DNA. But the whereabouts and the remains of most of the expedition members, including John Franklin, are unknown. Number 7. The Vivaldi Brothers Fandio and Euglindo Vivaldi were two brothers from the Republic of Giova who lived during the second half of the 13th century, and they were both thriving maritime merchants. Now, whether or not the siblings had a history of exploration and adventure, we don't know, but in 1291, they set off on a very ambitious journey to try to find a sailing route from Europe to India via Africa. It was the Cape route they were looking for, the sea lane that traversed the South Atlantic Ocean, rounded Africa at the Cape of Good Hope, and then crossed the Indian Ocean. Now, it served as the most important shipping route in the world for centuries, but the Villati brothers attempted to sail it almost 200 years before it was actually discovered by European explorers. So, of course, things did not go to plan. The brothers left Genoa in May 1291 aboard two galleys, and they were known to have made it out of the Mediterranean and to have sailed off the coast of Morocco, but once they hit the open ocean, they were never heard from again. Their ships nor their bodies were ever found again. Number Six. Alfred Gibson. Alfred Gibson was an Australian explorer who's believed to have died in an 1874 expedition organized by Ernest Giles, which sought to cross the deserts of Western Australia from east to west. Alfred departed from his companions on April 22nd, 1874, and was never seen again. The Gibson Desert into which he disappeared was named after him by his fellow explorer. He disappeared when he left Ernest with a compass and his horse, going back to fetch some water for himself, the mare, and Ernest, leaving Ernest walking. Now, Gibson is thought to have had lost his way and was considered dead as he did not return. Number five. Douglas Clavering. Scottish naval officer Douglas Clavering made a name for himself as an Arctic explorer, leading an expedition that surveyed Greenland and the Selbard Archipelago in 1823. After making his successful return to England, Clavering was given a different commission as part of the West Africa Squadron, Britain's recent anti slavery initiative. The squadron was formed in 1808 following the passing of the Slave Trade Act, and it consisted of a fleet of Royal Navy ships that patrolled the waters off the coast of West Africa in an effort to to suppress slavery. Captain Clavering became part of this squadron in 1825 after being appointed commander of the brig slop HMS Redwig. Although the West Africa squadron seized around 1,600 slave ships during its 50 year existence, little is known of Clavering's personal involvement. What we do know though is that two years after his appointment, the Red Wing set sail from Sierra Leone and was never seen again. Bits of the wreckage that washed ashore suggested that the vessel might have caught fire, perhaps from a lightning strike, but that's all we know. Number 4. Joshua Slocum In 1898, Canadian sailor and adventurer Joshua Slocum became the first man to single-handedly sail around the world. He had spent the last three years traveling 46,000 miles aboard his ship named Spray. Joshua then wrote an account of his experience titled Sailing Alone Around the World, which became an international bestseller. In 
Miller. His success also provided him with some financial stability, which allowed him to buy some land and settle down. However, he soon realized that he was more at home on the open ocean, so he resumed his sailing, often traveling between the United States and the West Indies or South America. Now, unfortunately, in November 1909, he left Massachusetts and headed for the Caribbean aboard his trusty spray. He was last seen resupplying in Miami before disappearing. Now, Joshua nor his ship were ever found. It's said that he perished at sea, especially since he apparently never learned how to swim, but others suggest that the adventurer faked his disappearance in order to start a new life away from his family. Number 3. Peng Jamu. By 1980, Peng Jamu had already established himself as one of China's premier biochemists, having taken part in multiple scientific expeditions over the previous 25 years to study the wildest, most remote regions of the country. That year, he left to explore the Lop Nur, a desert in the Tarium Basin. Five days into the mission, Peng vanished without a trace. It appeared that the scientist left camp alone in the middle of the night to search for water and got lost in the desert. Now, this was very puzzling, given that Peng was an experienced explorer who would have known better. Add to the fact that the extensive search by the Chinese government uncovered no signs of him, and this promoted several conspiracy theories that suggested that Peng could have had his life ended by his colleagues, was kidnapped by the Russians or Americans, or even defected of his own will. But it seems like we might never know what happened to him. Number 2. Michael Rockefeller Michael Rockefeller, the son of New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller, was 23 when he began dabbling in art and travel photography. In November 1961, he traveled to the jungles of New Guinea to spend time with the native Azmat tribes when he went missing. Despite a two week search and a witness who supposedly saw him swimming in the ocean, his body was never found. His official cause of death was noted as drowning, but conspiracy theories range from being kidnapped to going native and even being eaten by sharks. Now, another big theory is that he was eaten by people as the Azmat tribes were involved in that practice and sometimes ended people's lives as part of rituals. It's also been said that his boat overturned near the Azmat region of the island. The boy swam to shore to look for help and that's it. Nobody ever saw him again. But at least some members of local tribes have told stories indicating that Michael's life was ended upon reaching the shore and his body was cut up and the parts were handed out as gruesome trophies. Regardless of how or what happened, it will forever remain a mystery. And coming in at number 1 is Park Yang Siak. The mighty Himalayan peak now known as Annapurna Liz is one of the deadliest climbs in the world with a fatality to summit ratio of 38%. But that didn't phase legendary South Korean climber Park Young Siuk. He had set records across the globe, including becoming the first person to achieve the Adventures Grand Slam by climbing the 14 highest Himalayas, the highest mountain on each continent, and reaching the North and South Poles. While trying to establish a new route on the south face of Everest, two of his closest friends died in a fall. Park went on a drinking binge for six months and then reappeared, vowing to conquer the peak at any cost. Now, he succeeded in 2009, pioneering the new line on the mountain south face. Now, throughout his career, Park famously refused to quit smoking, predicting that he would be killed long before cancer could catch up to him. In 2011, his prediction came true as he and two companions vanished while trying a new route up Annapura 1. He was last heard from on October 18th when he radioed his intention to return to base camp following a gale and rock slide. A search party discovered a rope buried in the snow, but no trace of Park or his team members could be found. Mm -hmm.